The worst excesses of the Nazis are well known. The concentration camps, the violent anti-Semitism, the warmongering. The Holocaust Memorial commemorates the near genocide of the Jews. Other victims of the regime have their memorials as well. The new synagogue actually survived the Nazi pogrom of 9th of November 1938 when local police officers, in defiance of the political situation at the time, ordered the mobsters to disperse. However, the synagogue was later hit by British bombs and now only the facade of the original remains. But the effects that the Nazis had on Berlin itself are still very visible. Essentially, the plan was to replace Berlin with a new city to be called Germania, a city fit to be the capital of a new, powerful and invincible empire. In fact, the capital of the world. Most of the planned work was never begun, let alone finished, but there is enough to give a taste of what would have been. These buildings, for example, are on Fair Berliner Platz. The old home of the Ministry of Aviation is now used by the Finance Ministry. The master plan was to have two great roads, an east-west axis and a north-south axis. The east-west axis already partially existed as a long straight road from the city Schloss all the way to Charlottenburg, but it was to be widened and lined with impressive buildings. Mostly they got as far as installing new streetlights. The victory column has pride of place on this axis. It was built in 1873 to commemorate some German military victories, but it was moved here from its original position in front of the Reichstag, not as some guidebooks claim because it annoyed Hitler, but simply to give it more prominence. The figure of the goddess Victoria is known to Berliners as Golden Elsie and used to be known by American troops stationed here as the Chick on the Stick. The north-south axis was never actually built, but near the southern end of where it would have been is a very curious object, the heavy load-bearing body. This was built at the spot planned for a huge triumphal arch, but it wasn't known if the wet, sandy Berlin soil could take it. 12,650 tonnes of concrete were used to construct an object that rose 14 metres above ground and reached 18 metres below ground. Inside, measuring instruments were installed to monitor how the object would sink and settle. The results couldn't be analysed until after the war, but in the end it was found that, yes, the arch could have been built if the ground was first compacted. Since the body is in a residential area, there was no way it could be demolished safely. The original plan was simply to build over it, and so it still stands open to the public as a monument to the megalomania of the Third Reich. Not far away is Tempelhof Airport. It had in fact been in operation since 1924, but by the Nazi period had reached full capacity and needed to be replaced. In typical Nazi style, the new terminal building was intimidatingly huge, and for a couple of short years until the completion of the Pentagon, it was the world's largest building. After the war, the US Air Force continued to use the airport and in 1985 it reopened for civilian flights, eventually closing in 2008 to be turned into an urban park. This area had once been a military parade ground, but its connection with air travel started as early as 1909 when Orville Wright demonstrated his new flying machine here. 
Perhaps the most famous Nazi building is the Olympic Stadium, home to the controversial 1936 Summer Games. This was, for the Nazis, a major propaganda coup and they were determined to show Germany at its best. The torch relay, now an essential part of the opening ceremony, was actually instituted by the Nazis. It's not true that Hitler fled the stadium in order not to have to present gold medals to non-German athletes. It is, however, perfectly true that one black American athlete in particular put to the test the Nazi mythology of the master race. But Europe was heading once again for war. This block of flats was built over a Nazi-era air raid shelter, which survived not only the war, but subsequent attempts to demolish it. It can still be used as a shelter today, with spaces for nearly 5,000 people. The war, when it came, proved devastating to Berlin. In the city centre, about half the buildings were completely destroyed, the infrastructure demolished. It was the Soviet Red Army that finally liberated Berlin, but with Hitler ordering what troops he had left to fight to the last, it was a long and bloody battle in which 80,000 Russians died. The Soviets soon erected a war memorial where the Nazis had planned the north-south axis to intersect with the east-west axis. The memorial includes tanks and guns used in the Battle of Berlin and the unmarked graves of somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 soldiers. When Berlin was divided, this memorial ended up in the British sector, but the Red Army was allowed to maintain a guard of honour here until the troops finally withdrew in 1994. The main Soviet war memorial, though, is further east in Treptow Park. Another 7,000 soldiers are buried here. Meanwhile, Germany, what was left of it, was occupied by the four allies and divided into zones – American, British, French and Soviet. The city of Berlin was a special case and was itself divided into four sectors – American, British, French and Soviet. The occupying powers administering Berlin worked together to get the basic infrastructure working, but the Soviets were the ideological enemies of the other three, and the alliance based on a common hatred of the Nazis began to fall apart. In 1948, the Soviet member of the Allied Kommandantura administering Berlin simply refused to attend, and then the Soviets tried to gain control over West Berlin's economy. In June of that year, they blocked all road and rail connections to the city. The Western Allies responded with the Berlin Airlift. Food and supplies were flown in and manufactured goods flown out during a daring operation that saw planes landing and taking off at Tempelhof every few minutes. A monument to the airlift is located in the square outside the airport. A duplicate can be seen at the US military airport in Frankfurt. After 11 months of this, the Soviets called off the blockade. But the Iron Curtain was descending over Europe. 
Students and lecturers at the Humboldt University, which was now in the Soviet sector, were being arrested and deported by the Soviet secret police if they opposed the increasing communist influence. A group of them started their own university in Dalam, a residential area safely inside the American sector and probably one of the few places in the world that has a metro station with a thatched roof. Today, the Free University of Berlin has 35,000 students and is one of Germany's most prestigious. In the spring of 1949, the Western Zones formed a new country, the Federal Republic of Germany. Its constitution named Greater Berlin as one of its constituent states. Four months later, the German Democratic Republic was founded and its constitution stated that Germany was indivisible and its capital was Berlin. In 1950, the Berlin Constitution came into force in the Western sectors and it stated that Berlin was a state of the Federal Republic, but the Allies didn't allow this clause to come into effect. The situation was tense and it was only going to get worse. 